Maybe you had an experience like this when you were a kid. I remember this very vividly. All bright and shiny on a Saturday afternoon, running for the front door to go out and hang out and play with my friends. And a voice goes, Barbara Francis? Not good when the middle name is included. <laughs> Barbara Francis. Yeah? You cannot go and play with your friends until you clean your room and finish your chores. What? Now? Oh, come on, Mom. I mean, they're waiting for me outside, and the, the room's going to take a lot of time, and they might be gone before I get done, and wine, 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 wine. That's a certain kind of what now. I try not to do that so much as a grown-up, but there's another kind of what now that seems to come out of my mouth sometimes. I'm way stressed out, way overextended. Maybe some hard things have happened and I'm juggling too much and I feel kind of anxious and, and worried and the phone rings and before I even pick it up to see who or what it might be, I'm going, oh, what now? Assuming that it's gonna be something bad. Assuming and expecting the worst. That's another kind of what now thing I think we all identify with. Now I know the disciples had these kinds of what now experiences on their journey with Jesus. He was trying so hard to coach them and teach them and get them to see all that they could do and what was possible in the kingdom of God. And so there they are on the hillside and Jesus says, guys, 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 we've got 5,000 people here. It's lunchtime. We're going to need to feed them. And the disciples go, what? Now? Oh, come on, Jesus. We got like two fish and five loaves of bread. There's no place to go get more food. It isn't going to work out. Wine, 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 wine. They didn't get it. But I also think they had that other kind of what now experience. When they found themselves holed up in a room after Jesus had died, and they hear the Marys coming running down the road, just all shouting and banging on the door, let us in, let us in. And you know before they had a chance to say one word, those guys are sitting in there going, oh, what now? Because it had all been bad news for the last few days. I think Jesus had some what now moments in his life as well. We know that as he was finding his way in the world. Here he is in his 30s, right? I mean, he's in the prime of his life, and he's teaching, and some people are understanding, and he's making a difference in people's lives, and the message is so important, and he's trying so hard to reflect the love of God to every single person he sees, and it comes time to turn his life towards Jerusalem, and he goes, oh, God, what, now? Now I have to do this? And we know he had that what now experience because he prays in that garden. Oh, God, please, if I don't have to do this, please take this away from me. Something Jesus didn't want to do, didn't want to face. And then while he's in that garden, they come and they arrest him and they, they take him away they question him, they begin to humiliate him, to torture and torment him, they beat him, they try him, they crucify him by nailing his hands and feet to a cross. Sometimes I just can't take that in. They put a crown of thorns on his head, and I'm thinking by the time they tacked that sign above his bleeding head that said, King of the Jews, he must inside himself been thinking, oh, what now? What more can you do to me? And we know that he felt that way because the Bible tells us that one of his words was, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was experiencing the worst. Now, we are humans, and so there are always things that we don't want to do or things we feel we can't do, and things we just can't face or can't possibly live up to. And we are humans, and so we are bound to assume the worst sometimes because, well, hello, sometimes life does hand us really hard things. What we learn from Jesus' life and death, I think, is how to trust God 
all the time, especially when times are hard. Jesus was utterly and completely faithful to God. I like to say it this way, Jesus was so open to God that when we see Jesus, we see God. We see what love looks like in human form, and we begin to realize that that love can transform the absolute worst in this world. And so then what we learn from the resurrection is that when we truly trust God with our amazing, complicated, sometimes painful, very precious lives, the next thing is always Easter. When we trust God with our lives, the next thing is always Easter. A new beginning, a new possibility, some, something that is completely unexpected. Easter means that we do not need to fear death, for sure. Easter means that we are forgiven and forgivable. What a relief. Easter means that we are not alone, even when we feel alone. It means that we do not need to grieve over broken promises and missed opportunities in our lives. It means we can step out and risk ourselves sharing this love that we have found and experienced with anyone and everyone. We are free. We have joy. And Easter is the promise that any life, including ours, any moment in those lives, any disaster, any disaster, can be transformed by God. Any disaster can be transformed by love into something absolutely beautiful. Even our whining and our worrying, what now, questions, these too can be transformed by love. Trusting God, we may find ourselves smiling with our hands open and our eyes open saying, what now? What now? What, what possibility is before us? When we trust God, Easter is always the next thing that happens. Amen. I'd like us to offer one another words of encouragement as a parting blessing. It's on the screen. May we leave here today, each of us trusting God for clear direction, boundless grace, new beginnings, and much courage. May we leave here today reminded that when we trust God, the next thing is always, always Easter. Hallelujah. Amen.